Greetings and blessings. Greetings and blessings to the continent. Greetings and blessings to the diaspora. Greetings and blessings to the Caribbean. Welcome to Caribbean Vanguard. By now you should have heard about the recent summit in Washington hosted by President Joe Biden. It was a pitch to leaders of the continent, 49 leaders of the continent, to convince them that the U.S. is fully invested in the future of Africa's development. In doing so, the president invested $55 billion to the continent. That is $1.1 billion to every country if broken down equally. Uh, today, I want to share with you a video um, with the president of Ghana. He had some things um, to say, and, and I feel that the diaspora, the Caribbean, can take a lot from it, especially with the recent identity um, politics that's been happening, uh, specifically in the U.S., where folks are, are, are saying that they are this and they are that, and the, the confusion with our people. But anyway, I'd like you to take a listen to the president, president. of Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank the African and Diaspora Young Leaders Forum for making me part of this conversation and for the opportunity to deliver these remarks at the closing plenary in the presence of the U.S. Vice President, the Honorable Kamala Harris, and in this spectacular building, so admired by all Ghanaians and indeed by all Africans, as it was designed by one of the foremost architects of his generation, the globally acclaimed Ghanaian architect, David Ajay. The forum has chosen the most relevant theme of Africa's contemporary situation, a theme which sums up the essence of African aspirations, amplifying voices, building partnerships that work. I've stated it before, that it sometimes appears the words Africa and Africans have more resonance outside the continent than inside. When we are home on our continent, it always seems very important to assert that we are Ghanaians, Ivorians, Kenyans, Nigerians, Swazis, Senegalese, Rwandans, South Africans, and Zambians. Then we find ourselves outside the, the the continent, and then we discovered that to the, to the outside world, there are no Ghanaians, there are no Senegalese, and there are no Tanzanians. There are only Africans, and we are all simply Africans. The lesson for me is clear. Our destinies are intricately linked with each other, and we're talking not only about those of us on the continent, but about the Africans in the diaspora as well. You can be an honors graduate from any of the top universities of this country. You can be a second or third generation American, and you can be in a well-paid job. If there's an outbreak of Ebola someplace on the African continent, you are an African. Anyone, everybody in the position of leadership in Africa today, thus has his or her work cut out. The urgent responsibility we face is to make our countries and our continent attractive for our peoples, to see them as places of opportunities. It means we must provide education, quality education and skills training. It means our young people must acquire the skills that run modern economies. The impact of a successful Africa on the image and standing of Africans in the diaspora applies with equal force to the image and standing of her sons and daughters of the positive impact of diaspora communities on the growth and development of countries through so increased trade activities, rising investments, and the transfer of skills and knowledge. Take the case of China, for example, 
with an emigre population of some 60 million. The Chinese diaspora is said to be the 25th largest country in the world, who according to the Nikkei Asian Review, own assets worth 2.5 trillion United States dollars. When foreign companies in the late 1970s reduced their investments in China, it was the Chinese diaspora that shored up the economy. According to the Washington, D.C.-based Migration Policy Institute, MPI, half of the foreign direct investment, that is some 26 billion United States dollars, that transformed China into a manufacturing powerhouse in the 1990s, originated from the Chinese diaspora. That is the rationale of Ghana's initiative of Beyond the Return, which is building on the considerable success of the year of return and the renewed enthusiasm around building Africa together. We must work to help change the African narrative, which has been characterized largely by a concentration on disease, hunger, poverty, and illegal mass migration. Let us all remember that the destiny of all black people, no matter where they are in the world, is bound up with Africa. We should never forget that famous admonition of the celebrated Jamaican reggae star Peter Tosh when he said, and I quote, don't care where you come from, as long as you are a black man, you are an African, unquote. We must help make Africa the place for investment, progress, and prosperity, and not from where our youth flee in the hope of accessing the mirage of a better life in Europe, Asia, or the Americas. That is what the Beyond the Return seeks to do, so we can derive maximum dividends from our relations with the diaspora in mutually beneficial cooperation, and as partners for shared growth and development. The second half of the 20th century witnessed a great blow for human progress and freedom when the African peoples, in the wake of Ghana's shining example, liberated themselves from the colonial and imperialist yoke and the racist ideology of apartheid and emerged as free, independent people to construct new nations of hope and advancement. The first half of the 21st century should consolidate this development and see the growth of modern, prosperous, technologically advanced nations within a united Africa, which would make a reality of the dream of the 21st century as the African century and bring dignity and respect to black people all over the world. We've done enough talking, and dare I say we've had enough conferences and workshops. We know what we need to do. It is time just to do it. We've run out of excuses for the state of our continent. We have the manpower. We should have the political will. It is time to make Africa work. We have good reason to be proud of who we are and the beautiful continent that is ours with its vibrant cultures. The geographic space covered by Africa makes it the second largest of the seven continents. It has 30 percent of the world's remaining minerals of value. It is some of the most breathtaking scenes on our planet. It has plants and animals that are wonders of the world and critical for the survival of the globe. I hear a lot about the need to change our narrative and tell our own good story. Ladies and gentlemen, as the saying goes, nothing succeeds like success. If we work at it, if we stop being beggars and spend Africa's monies inside the continent, Africa would not need to ask for respect from anyone. We would get the respect we deserve.
Over 30 years ago, one of America's most prestigious Ivy League universities offered a course in Mandarin, which for years had virtually no takers. Today, there is standing room only. And it is not because the course is any easier. It is because the position of China has changed. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, China was nowhere near where it is today. China does not ask for any, anyone for respect now. She does not need it. Let us make our continent the prosperous and joyful place it should be, and the respect would follow. I thank you for your attention. So there you go. That was the president of Ghana, Nana Akufo. I like the fact that he was very direct and he did not shy away from reaching out to his people. Um, I also like the fact that he quoted Peter Tosh, who is a legend, one of my favorite reggae artists, uh, probably my favorite reggae artist. Uh, but Mr. Akufo mentioned that the song, or he quoted a song, no matter where you come from, as long as you are a black man, you are an African. And I really wish that more leaders in the West, African leaders can be as bold because many of them shy away from embracing us, from embracing who we are, right? So there's a lot to take away from this man. Okay, now I'm gonna share with you an interview. Um, someone was interviewing Dr. Ari Khanna, and I'd like you to take a listen to this. Those are some basic issues, no head of state. President Biden would not pick up and go to meet with any other leader in the world without an agenda. That simply doesn't happen. Right. So what makes the U.S. think that they can engage African leaders without an agenda? Come to Washington, let me tell you what I want to do for you. Come to Washington, let me tell you what you need to do in your country. And that game is, is an old game. Right. It's not going to work anymore. To be honest with you, if I'm to speak the truth, I hope a lot of heads of case don't come. Because it is an insult. It is an abuse of the Af African leaders. Mm. It's a disrespect of the African leaders. Where is the agenda? Please respect the African leaders. Do unto them what you would want done unto you. If the United States, for example, let's look at this particular uh, uh, meeting, this particular summit. There was no defined agenda. There has never been defined agendas whenever they meet with African countries as individual countries, it's always the United States setting the agenda, the United States setting the policies, and the United States telling the Africans about the policies. Mm. That is no way to have any meaningful engagement. If you take, for example, the fourth pocket meeting that was held between China and the African heads of state, way in advance, the issues were clearly defined. The agenda was going to focus on trade. It was going to focus on aid. It was going to focus on, focus on investments. The African heads of states were engaged in the discussion, in the planning. The outcomes were uh, clearly defined with a way forward in terms of follow-up. It was a fruitful meeting that addressed the issues that needed to be addressed between not only African countries individually with China, but also Africans collectively with China. There is no published agenda. There, is, there are no issues that have been presented to the African heads of states. Africans have, been, have not been asked to, to engage in terms of creating the agenda and making sure that when the African heads of states come to Washington, the outcomes, the issues to be discussed are going to be meaningful uh, outcomes, outcomes with follow-up and deliverables that are going to be beneficial to both. It remains a one-sided conversation with the United States telling the Africans the agendas and the policies. The Africans are not on the table to discuss issues pertaining to us. Wherein lies the problem. Mm. And the reason that continues to be the case, what underscores that is the disrespect for Africans. I repeated it. I, I complained about it repeatedly. It is a serious problem. The United States must understand that Africans are not going to take it anymore. If you don't treat the Africans fairly, the United States is going to see itself 
slowly losing ground to China, to Russia, to all other nations, because without respecting the Africans, without treating the Africans as equal, without understanding that exploitation and abuse of Africa simply cannot continue. This, this meeting, this summit, is going to be yet another gathering with no outcomes, no deliverables until the next summit. I'm sorry, but the disrespect of the Africans is at the bottom of it all. I, I, so it's really a simple ask. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned China and how China approaches this. I'm interested in what China gets so right, and, but is there a blind spot there? Are there problems in the China-Africa relationship from your perspective? Let me also, uh, let me just uh, hit the nail in the head and deal with, 10, 000, with the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room. Yeah. Racism as well hmm. plays a very important part. The disrespect of the Africans also goes back to a lot of the people who work in the U.S. government. Not all of them, but there's a significant of them who automatically assume that Africans do not know what they're doing. Africans need help. Africans need to be told what to do, and racism is also at the bottom of it all. We need to address the individuals who are going to be visiting Africa, engaging Africa. They must understand that Africans are equal to them. Mm. But when one goes to Africa with a sense of superiority, we realize the problem because you are not going to engage those leaders who are going to come to the table as equals, you go in feeling superior, you come back feeling superior. That is not an issue with the Chinese. The Chinese are coming in. The Chinese, yes, if you don't negotiate with them and uh, they win the game, then that's your fault. But they don't come in feeling superior. They understand that Africa has something they need. So they will come to the Africans. They will come and make sure that they let the Africans know that you matter to us, that our relationship with you does matter. That you don't get that feeling with the United States. You get the feeling that there's this sense of superiority, that you Africans, you ought to be glad that we are engaging you. You ought to be glad that we're inviting you to come to Washington. That sense of superiority, it has to change. Whether it, it calls for the United States to retrain their people as they engage Africa, but it is that uh, which really goes to the bottom of why the engagements are not going to be as effective they must take a page out of what Africa is doing. Let me say this. Chinese people didn't used to be that way, but they quickly changed their strategy. Mm. When they realized that the game they were playing was not going to work in Africa, they changed their strategy. And that's why, like I say, I said it during my tenure. I'll continue to say it again. If this was a basketball game, the United States need to call for timeout. This is a new game, and it requires new rules of engagement. The United States must, first and foremost, make sure that racism is out of the picture. Africans are just as smart as anybody else. Africans are equal. And until we engage as equals, all these meetings, all these conversations are always going to be useless. And it goes back to the individuals who are going to be at the table with the Africans. So the U.S. also need to address the issue of racism and make sure that the people engaging Africa, their minds are clear and they accept that Africans are equal. So there you go, lover or hater, this woman love her continent, she love her country, she love her countrymen, she love her people. And I love people who love me. My people love me, I love her back because many of us do not love each other. So that is great. And I like the fact that she stayed focused. It seems as though the interviewer was trying to drift her away from the U.S. You know, he brought up China, he brought up Pan-Africanism. By the way, if you want to listen to the rest of the video, the link will be shared below. But Dr. Arikana stayed focused on the target. She said that the relationship is, is not right and there are some things that need to change, and Africa needs to be respected. So I, admire, I totally admire that about her. Feel free. Feel free to share your opinion below and tell me what you think about this. Until then, be blessed. Take care.